verse, love, 192, sing with me on the first verse. I stand amazed, but Jesus the Nazarene, and a wonder, love me a sinner condemned, and oh how marvelous, wonderful and my soul. Savior's love for me on the second for me it was in the garden pray not my will but thine he had no grief but sweat drops of blood thine and oh how marvelous then my soul shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me when with the ransom and glory the but ages and his love for me seated. All right, well, it's good to have all you here tonight. We'll go ahead and start tonight with our prayer request, and if you have a prayer request, I want to uh, call upon you to make a prayer request known. I do want to let church know I received word coming into church at Miss Nellie's, uh, Miss Nellie, that they had taken her into the emergency room. They're not sure if she's going to be admitted, but she's I wasn't told exactly what's going on with her, but she's having some problems. And so if you remember to pray for her, Miss Nellie, okay? And also, um, I've mentioned to you about the Henderson, Brother Henderson, he's a missionary to Guam. And he uh, was released out of the hospital. Now, of course, he's... He's uh, <clears throat> going to have to stay here in the States for a little while and go through some more testing and so forth before he's released to go back to Guam. Uh, but at this point, the doctor had said uh, that, you know, they're just shocked at what has happened. They've ran many tests already, and the doctor said, we can't find any evidence at this point of any damage to your heart. He had a 100% blockage in, I guess, the artery that's behind his heart. And uh, he said what should have been death, uh, certainly massive heart attack. His son had gone to this, uh, this missions training over the summertime. Um, and during that time, he learned how to do CPR. And so he's with his father. And his father is having a heart attack. And his son thought to do CPR on him. It was a, and the doctor said it was aggressive CPR. And so he said that's what that's as best they can tell is what's kept him from having any sustainable damage to his heart. And so uh, rejoicing for just uh, how God has worked in all of that. Their family uh, flew in the states. I believe they arrived yesterday. I think they arrived today. Of course, with the time that they left on Monday, but they didn't get here till today. I guess our time. And so I still like for our church to do something and if an offering to help them out um, uh, with all those plane tickets uh, that they've had to purchase just on demand to come over. And so if you will be in prayer about that, we'll take that offering up on Sunday morning this coming week. Okay, so the Hendersons, thanking the Lord for that and asking for a good report as he goes back to the mission field. All right, on the side right here, prayer request. All right, Miss Helen. Yes, ma'am. 
surgery? Uh, pretty soon. Pretty soon. Okay. We'll pray for Brother Taylor as well. We'll write that down. Your daughter told me. You're amputating your foot? Is that what it was? I think, yeah. I'm just joking. <laughs> well, she was concerned. We were praying for you down with the kids um, as well. Brother Taylor has a Okay, someone else. All right. Miss Stein's cousin, is she has she been has Fem been able to get around her yet? Did you did you see the, the funeral service today? Um, I was at the office and stuff there. Um, and she was able to get around her cousin. Okay. All right, more prayer requests. Did you remember my daughter, grandson, and wife, and brother? Remember my girls, please. Continue to remember parents, Smith, uh, and as he's on, give me. Right, she has shingles, yes. Yeah, Miss Judy has shingles. I do not. I haven't, uh, I don't have any update recent. No, ma'am. A missionary letter tonight from the Mahaffey's, uh, our missionaries to uh, China. And he reads uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, And all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Since our last letter, the Lord has been confirming the direction he, uh, he has given us to follow. Previously, a church in Taiwan offered to provide us with a letter of invitation that would allow us to work uh, on the island. In preparation for a move, we will visit Taiwan 
during the month of November. While there, we will have the opportunity to visit several works as well as one of our own Team China members. Lord willing, we will confirm the field uh, to which we will return, and as soon as our visa, uh, visa paperwork is approved, we will leave uh, for Taiwan. There are clear and obvious opportunities not only to further our efforts to get the gospel to mainland China, but also to help, re help reach Taiwan as well. Please be praying for us to follow the Lord's path as we return to the field with hopes of eventually returning back to the mainland of China uh, and the converts who are eagerly waiting for us there. The Lord has also led our family to many people to hear the gospel since August along along our trail from church to church. We have given our gospel tracts everywhere we went. Of those who received them, we were blessed to see 10 receive Christ as their Savior. On one particular day, I met up with uh, it doesn't give the name, but just the initial E on her bus route. I got out of the car, had, headed across the street where and its initials again, KR, was getting ready to get on his bike. I passed him a track and began talking to him about the Lord. Before heading off to exercise, he exercised his faith by bowing his head and asking Christ to his heart. Later that same day, I had the privilege of telling Jay, initial, a Latino man, about Jesus, our Savior. Uh, Jay had never prayed for Christ's free gift of eternal life. He happily bowed his head and prayed to ask Christ into his heart. As we walked away, I was reminded of the time I was able to see a young man who had taken the name L, again initial, except Christ in China. I'm glad both Jay and L are going to heaven now. Who needs TV when you can go soul winning? It's just as entertaining and much more rewarding. Praise the Lord uh, for souls that are saved, uh, uh, that COVID restrictions in Taiwan have been dropped. Uh, praise the Lord also that N and J have come to the church several times. And he asks prayer for these things, the Holy Spirit's direction on the trip to Taiwan, uh, for E in college, uh, more laborers that are willing to go, Chinese converts that are under lockdown, divine favor from our official, uh, in, concern, in reference to our official paperwork, and that N and J to be saved. Thank you for faithful prayers and support. Bound to his service missionary, um, <clears throat> Hathi. And so, <clears throat> I guess it spells it out pretty good here. What I'm learning, have learned from several missionaries, is that China is, is closed at this point. And so a lot of these missionaries are having to redirect themselves. And so the Mahaffey family is praying about going to Taiwan uh, with hopes and prayers that they can eventually get back into mainland China. And so that's the prayer letter for us tonight. Okay, with that in mind, let's go ahead and go to prayer and ask the Lord's blessings. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Brother Taylor, I'm going to ask if you can pray for um, the missionary, the Mahaffey family. And there was a lot of things they said to pray for, but uh, obviously they're just wanting direction or paperwork and all of that uh, in reference to where God is directing them. And, and Brother Ben, I'm just asking you to pray for all your family. you got quite a few prayer requests here tonight, so I'm going to ask you to pray for them, and then I'll clean up the rest of them. Yeah, we come for you tonight. And thank you for your love and your mercy. We know you're always there. No matter where we're at, or here, or what country. It doesn't matter, Father. Sometimes we not even in our white state of mind, but we know you're still there. So we pray, Father, for the happy family, Father. We know there have been problems with many special needs. We don't know exactly how to pray, Father, but we know that you're able to, to answer every need. We know that you're very knowledge and wisdom. Anything we can think of and pray that you come from and strengthen and help them with all the special needs they have. Thank you for loving us all and for your mercies and your grace. We want to thank you for your many blessings already. We thank you for the Lord's care of us. The Lord has been good. Uh, many requests have brought forth a lot of special things. Brandon, Diane, Stella, and the Lord's mother. The difficulties that 
Miss Nellie and ask for just a comfort in her heart as she's at the hospital even now. We pray, Father, that she can just find some stability in her life with her health. She's had such ups and downs of late. We also pray, Lord, for Brother Henderson. Thank you for just a miracle. Um, just providentially how you laid all things out for him, his care. He just happened to be here in the States. His son just happened to had taken the CPR class and Lord, there's so many coincidences that demonstrate your sovereign work, and we thank you that you spared his life, and pray, Lord, for his provision, and that, Lord, you would lead our church uh, to be a, uh, financially to be a blessing and a help to this family. It's been faithful to you and sacrificed so greatly to serve you um, in your work there in Guam. Lord, we pray for many of our church family. We think of Miss Shirley, who's, Lord, just praying again for her comfort and her help, her care. We also lift up uh, uh, Brother Bob's family. I think his boys, he mentioned that they both are very sick. And uh, just pray, Lord, for all of them, that their family, Lord, be strengthened physically. And we thank you, Brother Vince. And, Lord, he's... Um, He's by himself, and we ask for his comfort by way of your spirit. Pray, Lord, you sustain him. Help us, Lord, as a church family to be mindful of him and, and to be an encouragers that we should be. Lord, we thank you for, uh, uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, what you've done in uh, Bob's life. Miss Helen's brother, and Lord, just the fact that you've restored this relationship with her and Helen. We thank you that the conversation has been opened about a salvation, but Lord, we pray that it won't stop there. We ask, Lord, that you will continue. We pray, Lord, you'll take his sleep away. We pray, Lord, his thoughts will be dominated with his eternity and where he's destined to spend it unless he gets saved. Lord, I pray that you just use circumstances, use Miss Helen's testimony, use his mother's testimony uh, to help him to see. And Lord, we ask, please, Lord, I know you, you in turn are not going to force him to get saved, but we pray, Father, that you bring into his life circumstances, Lord, we has no place to turn but to you. Lord, we pray for um, the Becketts and just ask for their whole family, uh, that you continue to sustain them. Thank you for the Becketts. They can be here faithful in church. What a, what a wonderful testimony and example they are to us as a church family. We pray especially for his daughter and son-in-law and his granddaughter and as he carries a heavy burden for their spiritual state and ask for you to work in their regards. And we lift up Brother Taylor and this uh, procedure coming up very soon. Just pray for help with all of that, Lord, that it would go as it should, that you would give wisdom. Lord, I also uh, pray for Brother Paul, uh, Brother Paul's family, his girls. He, Lord, he just uh, so so burdened for them, his girls and his granddaughters, and that they would find themselves in the will of the Lord. And Lord, we pray that. Not, Lord, that hardship would come or not that failure would come, but, Lord, that they could see in their life how much they need Christ and how much they need to live a faithful life to Him. May, Lord, you bring into life that which will open their eyes to see it. Please, we thank you for the good report from Miss Tammy. And we lift up Perry Smithson and ask, Lord, for this young man that he be a testimony for Christ for where he is, that your will is done in regards to his kidneys. We also pray for Jennifer Skaggs, who's on this rejection uh, list again. And 
Lord, all of this is certainly in your knowledge and understanding. I just pray that Jennifer would just follow you and just allow you to do what you're doing in her life at this time. And Lord, we, we pray for just the service tonight that you would accomplish your will in it. May you minister to us by your words. We lift up Miss Tinker again and thank you, Lord, for what you have done. Pray even tonight that they may feel and understand the love of God and the love of the church family. And that, Lord, that you would just open the door very wide for them and at the right time. That Ms. Tinker would get the surgery that's so needed, Lord, and she'd be delivered from his pain. We pray for Miss Jesse. We pray for Miss Francis. We pray for many of others that are not able to come. Just ask for your watch care over them. Help us, Lord, we pray. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. <clears throat> Well, I would like to open the floor up for anybody who would care to testify tonight. And so, uh, if you would care, and then speak up, please. I'd like to stand up and praise the Lord. Just thank Him for all we've been there. Amen. Thank Him for His mercy. He knows what we need before we even need Him. Uh, it is amazing what He can do. Mm. You know, we, we get in, you know, downtrodden and different things going on, and you wonder why, but... He don't have to wonder about anything. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows what we need when we need. Amen. Just thank you for your time. Amen. Somebody else tonight. Sister Marty, I just, I just want to praise the Lord. Amen. You know that she had a transplant. Everything's just perfect according to her doctors or another capacity. Exactly where they would like to have it. And they can say that they're absolutely tickled to death. Amen. Of course, we know, we know who they're done. Amen. We know the great physician. We know there's not a sickness. There's nothing that he can't take care of if it's his will. Amen. And I, I just want to praise him. Mm -hmm. My mind just can't understand mm -hmm. just how good and awesome he is. And I thank him for answer their prayers and I thank y'all for praying for my wife. Amen. Alrighty. Anybody else? Amen. All right, stand 191. Oh, let me say, just stand up and walk around and say hi to everybody. Greet everybody, smile and be friendly and happy. You know, just fake it. That's all you need to do. Just be a hypocrite about it. We we know the truth. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, be happy and shake one another and greet each other for the service tonight.
the song book, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. Sing it with me. On the chorus, 191. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones, him belong, weak but he is strong. And yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, the Bible. All right, you may be seated. James in chapter number two tonight. James chapter number two. I encourage you to get your Bible. We'll get into study tonight. We're going to be in James two verses one through seven. Lord willing, we'll make a good attempt to get these done. James chapter two verses one through seven is where we are at tonight. Alrighty. Are you there? Say amen. Amen. All right, good. Notice, if you will, in verse number one, it says this. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile arraignment, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil faults? Hearken, my brethren, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor, do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? And we're going to stop right there. I don't think we'll get that far, but we'll make a good attempt at it. Let's have a prayer. Father, we love you and thank you for your scriptures. Pray, Father, that you help us to just settle down and, and focus upon you and your words tonight. Lord, it's even for me as the one who has the privilege to be a voice and to speak from your words tonight. Lord, I, I need likewise to follow you and to let you speak through your words. You're a good God and a faithful God. And Lord, your wisdom is, is not comparable to anybody's wisdom. We know that you know all things. And yet too often we, we just give, we give allegiance and we give time and interest to, to men and women and institutions as they speak. And yet we do this at the expense of hearing from you. We pray that tonight that we would sit still long enough to hear you speak in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would say that uh, one of the great difficulties that we have as, as Christians is that we live in a, a two-world perspective. And what I mean by that is, is that we, we act one way, perhaps in church, and that's not always consistent. We, we think one way in regards to our Christianity, and again, that's not always consistent. But yet, it's, it's understandable. We would, we would say... Uh, uh, we should act this way and talk this way and speak this way, etc., because we're Christians and we accept that. And that's all totally acceptable here in church. However, we, we step out of the church building and then we go into Walmart or we get into traffic or, or we go to work or we go someplace where we're not surrounded by people that are Christian and we're in a different world, if you will, and we exercise a different worldview. In fact, it's a carnal worldview. In fact, it's a worldview that we held prior to our salvation and somehow we feel that this is acceptable. And yet you and I as Christians have been called to be as Christ inside the church as we are in our home. 
inside the church as we are in our workplace, inside the church as we are anywhere in this world and with whomever it may be, that we operate not by a two-world perspective, but by a one-world perspective, and that's the world perspective that was given to us upon our salvation, and it's what's taught to us in the scriptures. I read a story about a pastor, he's actually a bishop, and he, <laughs> he was traveling, uh, traveling through Europe, and he was preaching and so forth, and he was on an ocean liner, and when he got on board the ocean liner, he went to his room, he was actually staying in a room that housed another person, so two people would be staying in this room, and uh, this is many years ago, by the way, this is going back probably a hundred years ago, and so he saw the gentleman that was in the room, and immediately he was arrested, and, and he went back to the very front, the lobby area of the ship, and he said, I understand you have some type of, um, uh, you know, storage for security, and that we can give things. I've never used it before, but I would like to use it. And the gentleman said, yes, we do. And so he gave some valuables to this man. And as he was giving the valuables to him, he said, you know, uh, I've never done this before, and I apologize for inconveniencing you. But he said, I went to my room, and I saw the gentleman that was in my room, and I'm just really concerned. Uh, and so I decided I'd bring my things here and give it to you just to be a safe, you know, I just don't know about this person. And the man behind the counter said, I totally understand because your roommate felt the same way about you and brought his things up here as well. <laughs> and so it's, it's a two-world perspective. Now, I'm all for partiality about some things, and I think it's appropriate. I'm partial to some foods. Can I get amen on that? <laughs> and I don't think that really matters. I don't think God's going to be bothered at the fact that, that one is partial to Mexican food, another one is partial to Chinese food. I don't know that God cares about that, and certainly has no bearing upon how we treat people, or has no bearing upon eternity and what even matters in that regards. I'm partial to a way of life. I'm partial to my church. I'm partial to my family. I'm partial to my kids. And I, I would say that would even be appropriate and right that I'm partial to my church. I have responsibility there. And God has placed these ones in my life. And certainly my wife is uh, not only that she got placed, but it was a choice that she and I made to be together. And, and so that partial toward, with, we give ourselves to each other. I think in, in many regards, this, is, uh, this perhaps is a, is a right thing to do. But when we look inside of our society, just stop for a moment and think about this. Just think about the partiality, or probably the better word uh, for our message tonight is prejudice that exists in our society. Uh, we just went through a, a huge ordeal uh, during, the COVID, during the COVID time in regards to Black Lives Matters and with this George Floyd incident that happened up in Wisconsin. In anybody's life that ends as his life ends is sad. Death is always sad. And it doesn't matter if the man is the person is a woman or a man or a child or an elderly person or if the person is black or white or Hispanic. It doesn't matter. Death is always sad because that person is going to face eternity. And if they're not ready to die, then in turn we understand what they will face. They'll face eternal judgment of God. And so we, we, we in turn can sit here and say, well, you know, this man in turn earned what he got. And please help us to be more merciful than that. That we would look upon someone and say, well, he got what he deserved. And not that anybody here has said such a matter about this or any other, any other situations. But the whole scenario was sad. But what happened after that was this, this idea of this pushing, if you will, and this platform became a platform for Black Lives Matter that just invigorated this message that went across America. I was driving through um, Union shortly thereafter, and there was a monument that was set up, and it said, this is the first time that I had seen it, until black lives matters, nobody's lives matters. Now think about that statement. And even to say these things publicly can, can make a uh, church such as this make people feel uncomfortable. And oftentimes, for us who are not black, we would start off a conversation and say this, I'm not prejudiced, why do we even have to say that? Why do you have to say or address that you're not prejudiced? Why would you be prejudiced anyway? Don't, do you not have a conscience about that matter? And, uh, and so we understand, we certainly understand, when you get outside of the walls of the church, we understand that that is society. And by the way, the prejudice in America is not between the blacks and the whites, that definitely is there. The prejudice in America is in every facet of our society. Every facet. 
It's, it is the rich to the poor. It is the educated to the uneducated. It in turn is, is those ones who are Chinese and those ones who are white and those ones who are black and those ones who are Mexican. We see it in every facet. It's the ones that live on this side of the track and the ones that live on that side of the track. It's the ones that in the medical field that are doctors and those ones who are nurses. In fact, in every facet of our society, we see this division, this prejudice that takes place. And what forms from that is cliques. Have, have we ever seen cliques before? Have we ever seen cliques inside of a church? I mean, can you imagine that? And I have to say to you, there's few things that are more hellish and few things that demonstrate the natural man, the carnality man. There's few things that demonstrate that a man or a woman or a church in turn has fell off the pathway of walking according to scriptures and spiritual maturity than cliques. There's few things. We don't have that privilege. That's not the nature that I have as a Christian today. I don't have the right to go around and say, I like this kind of people, I don't like that kind of people. You know, I like this color of people, I don't like that color of people. I like the people that in turn dress this way, but I don't like the people that dress that way. I like the people that have money, I don't like to be around the people that don't have money. I like this, I don't have the privilege. Now certainly there are things that I prefer, no doubt. And there's, no, there's nothing wrong with you having a preference. There's nothing wrong with that. But there is something wrong when we, in turn, begin to treat people based upon those prejudices. Prejudge is. Prejudgment. There's something wrong with that. And we, in turn, have to uh, be very mindful of this, that in our life, and, it, and as I mentioned to you about this pastor, he walks into a room, and instead of seeing this man and thinking, here's a man I can minister to. Here's a man that I, in turn, can perhaps uh, be a help to. He looked at the man and squared him off and said, I need to make sure I protect myself because this man here is going to rob me, take what's valuable to me. He made immediate decisions in reaction to that. And so we don't live by prejudice. And this certainly is not the mindset of our God. Now going back to our text, uh, chapter number one, we remember, it talks about growth. Here we're talking about growing and how are we going to grow by pressure. God grows you by pressure. You're not going to grow because you hear something uh, taught. You're going to grow because God puts you under pressure. And that's what the trials of life are about. Well, verses 1 through 7 of chapter number uh, 1. And in that time, God has one intent. He wants to change you and to grow you to be like Christ, to reflect his image. That's what he wants. You say, how am I doing, preacher? Compare yourself to Christ. Do you love like him? Do you treat people like him? Are you faithful like him? Well, certainly none of us match up. But in turn, we, we should compare ourselves to Christ because that's the person that we're growing to become like. In verses number uh, 13 down to verse number 16, in this time, when we're going through our time of growth, and Christ is working in our life, it is at that time that Satan brings temptations in our life for the intent to spring a stumbling block so he can stunt your growth, keep you from growing. And so what is our recourse in this matter? And really the remainder of the chapter deals with our response to the word of God. The Bible is what God has given you. Have a relationship with the Bible. It must be read every day, meditated upon, listened to out throughout the week. You should discuss it and talk about it. The Bible is the only thing that's going to change your thoughts, which ultimately changes your actions. And so the Bible is capital. How do you receive it? And here he gives us some examples of people that listen to the Bible and live out the Bible. And that was seen in how they take care of orphans and widows and uh, those ones that are poor, etc. He's shown. But if we get in chapter number two, this continues. Now we're really in the subject. We're talking about the subject of someone who really is living out their faith. Someone who's really showing that they have Christ. And if this is a person that you say, man, they know Jesus Christ. And James here doesn't waste any time. James is, is, is really combative about this, about this particular issue in chapter number 2. And he deals with the issue of being prejudiced or respecter of persons. And so uh, that brings us to uh, verses number, verses 1 and verse number 7 is what we're going to talk about. And I want to begin by just saying to you that, that faith in Christ and favoritism in regards to people do not mix. We cannot do that. They're not compatible. It's wrong. Now open your Bible, or turn your Bible if you will, hold your place here. Let's look back in Deuteronomy chapter 12, and we're going back <clears throat> quite a bit uh, to just get a little bit of the attitude or spirit, if you will, of, of our Lord.
All right, Deuteronomy chapter number 10. Chapter number 10, are you there? Say amen. Notice, if you will, verse number 17 and 18. For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons nor taketh reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye are strangers in the land of Egypt. Now this really coincides with what we read in chapter number one, the latter part. God is not prejudiced or partial, or maybe I would say shows favoritism in this regards, and we see this illustrated here in regards to judgment. Look, if you will, over in 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, quickly. I want to finish up here this section this morning, tonight. 2 Chronicles chapter 19. Our Lord is not a respecter of persons. And you say, preacher, he chose the Jews. He did. And that was the, I mean, really... <laughs> This was the capital issue in regards to the nation of Israel through the Old Testament. God chose them, but they, they interpreted that God was prejudiced toward them. And we find over and over again, God bringing circumstances in their life, using individuals like Jonah, using natural disasters, using, if you will, their own failures to help them to understand that God doesn't, he is not prejudiced toward the Jews. He chose the Jews so he could use them to in turn to magnify himself to all the world. And yet the Jews in turn were prejudiced. They thought that God loved them more than anybody else. God doesn't love them more and he doesn't love you more uh, than he loves someone else and certainly doesn't love a pastor more than he loves or evangelist more than he loves them. No. But yet because if we are not walking in the spirit and living by the word of God, and we always will fall prey to that mindset that we feel that God is prejudiced, and we'll, we will behave that way, and thereby be prejudiced ourselves. You're in uh, 2 Chronicles 19, verse 6, it says this, and he said to the judges, these are the ones that are obviously making decisions, these, uh, in, these civil decisions uh, in regards to disputes, etc., et in Israel, he says, take heed what ye do, for ye judge not for man, but for the Lord who is with you in the judgment. Wherefore now, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with, iniquity with the Lord, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. And so clearly, <clears throat> here they were instructed, you are judging on God's behalf, so therefore represent God properly. God is not a judgment of judgment a show respecter of persons. God is not one that can be bribed. God is not one that in turn it shows favoritism, so very, be very careful about that. So we talk about favoritism or respect of persons or partiality. Uh, really, it, it, what this is, the idea is that, it, that you pander to somebody because of their influence or their wealth or their popularity. You, you, you judge a book by the cover. And thereby you respond accordingly. It's to be prejudiced. And the opposite of that is to treat everybody the same. To treat everybody the same. And so respect of persons, you can see this uh, in different avenues, such as discrimination, which is a word that's oftentimes used at I don't even want to use the word tonight because it's so misused, I believe, today. But discrimination is uh, one way in which you will just categorically, you will separate, you know, a, a, a group of people and say, boom, they can't have because they're Christian or they can't have because of their skin color or because of whatever would be the case. It certainly is being a respecter of persons. Uh, or, in turn, it's seen by prejudices. I've mentioned several times already. It's having a preconceived judgment or opinion about somebody and then treating them accordingly. You know, and you act accordingly to that. Um, the, um, I've, uh, uh, I'm trying to think. So, 
I better not. It was a funny joke. I thought it would be funny. But anyway, um, so these are avenues or ways in which we, we see this partiality or favoritism or respect to persons that comes out. And James is not talking about the kind of discernment that comes through understanding another man's character. You know, regardless of what a person's, they're poor or rich, or whether they're red, yellow, black, or white, and turn is not the issue. When you come to know someone and you experience them, you're going to figure out a little bit about their character. And at that point, at that point, you may need to compensate and how that you in turn minister and help and love, but also how you protect so that you in turn are not negligent to your, that which you're responsible to either. But, but the idea is that you just don't carte blanche to all those ones who are poor or carte blanche to all those ones who are rich or carte blanche, you just write off all those ones who are black or carte blanche, you just write off all those ones who are Mexican. And we tell jokes accordingly because we behave accordingly. That's how we live. We live a life of favoritism, partiality, and prejudice, and we treat people accordingly. And the scripture here is clearly teaching us that we are to treat all men the same, regardless, regardless of who they are, regardless of, of what, you know, what skin color, rich or poor, or whatever may be the case. Now, if that individual happens to be a very perverse individual, then yes, there are laws and there are, there's right things that need to come into place in dealing with that person. You understand, we can't even exercise justice today in America. We've become so partial. We've become so such a respecter of persons that, that, that if a person was to break laws now, before we can determine if we exercise judgment based upon one man's actions, we first have to investigate many other things about him. His skin color. Whether he's poor or rich. What his background is. He's not judged according to law. He's judged according to prejudice. And that's wrong. It's wrong. If a pastor in turn is breaking of the laws of God and he has stepped out of way of the scriptures, that he falls under the judgment of the church and the church has the responsibility and the right that they judge the church accordingly by the scriptures and exercise church discipline. When I was in Nicaragua before my time there, there was a pastor of a church and his pastor was involved in some very some very unscriptural activity and and I won't get into what he was involved with but it was it was not good it was very bad and, and there were m leaders in the church that they they came to understand it they verified it they confronted him about it he did not deny it they had hard proof they knew that it was true and then the church called upon him to step down out of his pastor and go into church discipline and he wouldn't do it he wouldn't do it and in the church, there was a, really a divide because there was part of the church that was said, listen, he's the pastor, he's the man of God, and we'll just let God deal with him and so forth. He's, you know, it's not for us to deal with. And others in the church that said, we really need to deal with this because he's broken the laws of God and we have a responsibility according to scriptures. And, you know, before it was over with, the law got involved with it. Literally, the police came in and one of the young men that worked with me in, in Nicaragua was actually arrested and placed in jail because of what was taking place in that activity. And incredible. I mean, how, because this pastor felt that he was above the law because of a position that he held. I am a Christian, just like you are a Christian. And I'm not above anything or anybody, and neither is anybody else here. And we, in turn, don't look upon anything with prejudice and judge it thereby. We look at it as it is, based upon the individual loving that person as they are, and when we have responsibility or right, that we treat it such as we should according to Scriptures. And yet it's difficult. So justice has been lost in America. Rephrase that. We're losing justice in America, and it's primarily, certainly it is because, you know, we've confused right and wrong, no doubt. But I would believe one of the main factors of why we're losing a judgment justice in America is because there's such a heightened emphasis upon prejudice. There's such an attack upon discrimination that we have reverse discrimination, reverse prejudice. So now, that's why you have signs that would say 
such as until black lives matters nobody lives matters well that in turn is a very very prejudiced statement that's very discriminatory so nobody's life matters until every black man that is that is a black person that is living is their life matters well it matters their life does matter but a black man's life does not matter more than a brown man. And a brown man's life doesn't matter more than a red man's. And a red man's life doesn't matter more than a child that's in a womb of a mother. All lives are the same. And we don't treat people according to prejudice or treat people according to partiality. We treat them as God has commanded us to do. Now, I can't correct that. I can't correct it and I'm not even going to try to correct it. That's not the point. And that's what I was mentioning in the beginning is a two-world perspective. But that is not who I am anymore. Before I walked according to the course of this world, before that's who I was, before that's where I was, before I got saved, but now as a child of God, I in turn don't have two worldviews. I should only have one worldview, and that's to see people as God sees people and to treat people as God treats people, period, and nothing else which eliminates the partiality and the favoritism and all of the prejudice and all of that. It just eliminates it. Now, uh, with that in mind, a most interesting story, I might have told this before, in, 19, or in 1884 there was a family, a very unpretentious family, a plain family, a family uh, that just lived very simple in their lifestyle. And their child had passed away. They were mourning after the funeral. The father, uh, the mother and the father, they decided they want to do something significant in honor of their son's death. And they, they decided that they would seek out some colleges and see if maybe perhaps that, that they could get some assistance with. They met with the, then the president of Harvard, and the main, man's name was Elliot. And they ex explained their situation. In comes this couple. They're plain. They're unpretentious. And they sit down in his office and he said, we, we would like to do something to honor our son's death. And the man, the president said, well, what are you thinking about? Maybe something like a scholarship. And he says, no, we were thinking about something much more significant than that. We were thinking about maybe a building. And the president really just blew them off and said, well, that's very expensive. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that's not anything you'd be interested in. And and, and just dismissed them out of the office. And that couple left there, and they went to a little college out in California, a junior college, and they sit down with the president there, and they talk with him as well, and they established in 1884 a $26 million trust and established what is now today Stanford in honor of their son. And so you imagine this president, uh, the president of Harvard at that time, which was one of the most you know, renowned colleges of America in that day, especially. That he just dismissed because he had a spirit of prejudice, a spirit of, uh, of, of favor. He looked upon them and judged them and treated them according to what he thought they were, not according to who they were. That was right. And what a great loss, great, great loss that happened as he, in turn, was uh, in charge of Hanford, what could have been you know, a great benefit to furthering what they believed their cause to be, and he lost it because of their spirit of prejudice. Now back, if you will, uh, in James chapter number 2, and let's uh, quickly look at the example that's given here by James. Pastor James gives us an example in verse number 2, and he says in verse, to verse number 4, For there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come and also a poor man in vile raiment. Do ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou here, or sit thou uh, sit here under my footstool? Are you not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? There's a pastor over in, in Princeton, and to my knowledge he's still living. I ran into him about a year ago. His name is Norm Arrington. Has anybody heard of Norm Arrington? Brother Arrington is... Uh, he uh, pastored a little church that I attended with my aunts when I was a child, Series Baptist Church. Um, and I, I really, just really enjoyed him as a child. It was captivating. Uh, but he spent some years as an evangelist. He's now pastoring, or was pastoring last time I heard him. I spoke to him. And he uh, made a regular habit of doing this from what I was told. Uh, churches would invite him to come and preach, and if the church had never met him before, then he would dress down and 
poor clothing and maybe even clothing that was dirty and then he would maybe you know not look real clean even in his physical appearance mess his hair up and so forth and he would come to the church that day prepared to preach unannounced no one knowing who he is except for the pastor and many 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 times by his testimony he was mistreated by people in the church by the ushers uh, people in turn having bad feelings and saying comments to him and then when the pastor said well we have a special guest speaker today <laughs> we're going to ask brother Norma Arrington to call him up and to preach for us and so <clears throat> in this given situation he James used the illustration of a man who is rich and influential, perhaps has position, as opposed to a man who's poor, and a man who is not only poor, but he's in vile attire, he's, he's dirty and he's poor. And both of these people come into the congregation, the assembly, like our church here, and the one man that comes in, and boy, he is dressed up, wearing a nice suit, and he's literally looking good, and he has the appearance and the air that he is successful and influential, and he has money, and then the leadership and the ushers, they say, oh, good to have you today. Come on up here and sit right here in the seat. Boy, we're just glad to have you. And another man walks in, and this person doesn't appear to be somebody that can do something for us, but somebody that perhaps is going to take a lot from us. He's poor. They in turn say, well, you know, just wherever you want to be. We don't have a seat for you. Just stand over there in the back. Now the Lord here, James here is rebuking this, and he says in verse number 4, Are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? And so understand, he's using this as an example, emphasizing that you know nothing about this man that is rich necessarily. You don't know anything about the man that is poor. But they've walked into your congregation, and you've given favoritism to the man that is rich, and you in turn have you know, shown disdain or you're shown that you're not willing to even help or be hospitable to the man that is poor. And you've done this based upon prejudice, upon partiality. Not because of their character. Not because of, of what they, who they are and what they've done and who they, you know, that they know Christ or don't know Christ. It's nothing about that. You've done it merely because of your evil thoughts. He walks in and you look, oh yeah, anybody that's dressed like that probably is good to their wife and probably pays their bills. And I'd say they're probably honest. And I'd say they probably are good. And I'd say that person probably would be a good church member here and probably with this and all that. You know, all these thoughts come. And that's the prejudice, the partiality, the prejudice that then, then results in you giving partiality to this person's rich. And a man that walks in vile and poor clothing. Well, sure. You know why he's that way? He's that way because he's lazy. He's that way because he's of this nationality. He's that way because he did this or that. He was probably on drugs. He was probably this. He was probably that. Da da da. And all that sort of thing. He just get what he deserves. And in turn, you don't even know who he is. Know nothing about him. But you've you've shown prejudice, and now you're shown partiality in how you treat that person based upon your evil. We don't have that privilege. God, in turn, has not called me to be a judge of men, but has called me to be a witness, a witness, a witness unto men. God has not called me so that I can be partial and, and favorites and, and be prejudiced. All of that is up to God. God can rise up and sit down and love. He can do whatever he wants to do, but that's not my department to do that. And in turn, uh, this shows... Uh, an area of tremendous growth that's needed in our life and it shows a lot of immaturity uh, in our life if we behave such way, such a way with a person. And uh, Gandhi had wrote in, his, uh, <clears throat> in his, his autobiography, during his time of seeking, he strongly considered Christianity. Uh, in fact, he was so convinced about Christianity that he actually got up one morning, got dressed, and he said, I'm going to go to a church, and he said, I'm going to sit down with the pastor, and I'm going to let this pastor help me to understand how to be saved or how to convert to Christianity or whatever that is. 
and, and Gandhi was very bothered by the caste system of India. And we, we in turn, perhaps intellectually understand what the caste system is, that we perhaps have not necessarily experienced it as they did in England or in, in India. But the caste system was very, it was very punishing for them. And he walked into the church and, <clears throat> and the church, and as he came into the church, the ushers met him at the back doors of the Christian church. And the ushers, in turn, uh, uh, spoke to him, and he basically said to him, says, look, you know, it's really better for you not to be here at this church. You really need to just go find a church that, you know, you can be with your own people and, and not be here with us church, which is not really a good place for you to be. And they dismissed him. And he left, and he said, he said, I guess I didn't understand that Christianity has a caste system as well. Here's a man that was coming to, I mean, a man that had, a, he had a magnitude effect upon the, the Republic of India, uh, upon, uh, upon the society of India, and has even still to this day has an impact of, uh, a, a, ma a powerful impact uh, as far as his teaching and philosophies all over the world. And this man came to church wanting someone to explain salvation to him. But when he walked in the back door, there was people there that professed to know Jesus Christ, that they professed that they in turn were examples of what Christ would have them to be, and yet they treated this man with partiality. They were prejudiced. And pushed him right off the back many things we learn from that. One of the things we learn is this. There's few things that are going to witness better. Few things that you and I can do and behave and act that will witness better than have a heart that's empty of prejudice and partiality. Everybody in this world is living under that. They live under it in their families. Some families, in turn, and some kids are accepted and some are not because of whatever may be the case. They live in their neighborhoods. Some are rich and some are poor. They live in school. All the terrible things that happen to kids in schools that we, we just rarely ever hear about or know about. But they come in because they're poor or because they have some type of impediment or, or, or disability or whatever, and they're treated accordingly. And yet, where in the world are they going to find a people, a place, that they in turn can experience the love of God? And you walk into most churches, and you got all your little cliques inside the church. you got this little clique over here, and this little clique over here, and this little clique over here, and this little clique over there. That demonstrates how you mature. It shows the carnality. We're not here for a man. We're here for Christ. And we come so that we in turn can exalt Jesus Christ. And we do that by our life and how we treat people. And when we learn to love people in that fashion, that's the brightest light that we can shine to people for salvation. It's a light of God's love and acceptance. We'll finish on the passage next week. Father, we love you and thank you. You're good and a faithful God, and we just exalt you tonight to think that you love us in spite of ourselves. And Lord, you love the rich and you love the poor, and that you love the uneducated and the man that has many degrees. You love that one that has just wallowed in the perversions of life, and you love that one who lives in a monastery. And that, Lord, that you have open arms to all of them, inviting them to come into your presence to have a relationship with you. Oh Lord, help us as a people to learn to love like you love. Lord, please convict us of being prejudiced and partial. We point fingers at the Black Lives Matters, but yet, Lord, we, we practice that in our own lives in another way. Or just as prejudice, just as discriminatory, just as partial, oh Lord, help us. Help us to be faucets of the love of God. And we, Lord, would love people. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name.